It's a pleasure being with you today. The title of this talk is Basic Communications Concepts to Change Risky Behaviors. There are no disclosures for this presentation. Objectives include understand the importance of meaning transfer, understand the basic differences between outrage, crisis, and apathy communication strategies, discuss general strategies to increase awareness and concern to deal with public apathy, describe the importance of community engagement in changing risky behaviors, understand the major components of the communications model, discuss the role of horizontal communicators in community engagement, understand the different uses of social marketing and community engagement in public health messaging, and describe the importance of informal messaging in changing risky behaviors. This slide lists the major tools we have to change risky behaviors. First, there's policy developed by governments, local, state, and national, businesses, schools, and other organizations implemented by statute and rule. Policy can be either good or bad. Good policy sets an environment encouraging healthy choices. Another set of tools is the clinical setting with clinicians providing one-on-one -on -one counseling, a powerful tool. The third set of tools are population-based interventions, the domain of public health. Population-based interventions can be subdivided into two subsets of tools, social marketing and community engagement. Community engagement is a common term used in our society, yet true community engagement is a relatively new concept in public health. All of these tools, policy, clinical, and public health, social marketing, and community engagement are needed to change risky behaviors. The integration of these tools, breaking down silos as recommended by the Institute of Medicine in their 2012 integration report, will be key to effectively impacting risky behaviors. This talk focuses on a few basic concepts that inform public health communications strategies. Much of what we do to change risk factors revolves around health messaging, whether in social marketing, individual counseling, or engaging at the community level. The purpose of health communications is to effectively transfer messages that results in meanings in recipients of that message to ultimately change risky behaviors. Health professionals have often been guilty of transferring well-selected words, not necessarily meaning. Transferring words is often not enough to convince people to change high-risk behaviors. True communication is therefore not just the transfer of messages or words, but of meanings that impact the behavior of respondents. The textbook definition of meaning is the input of our senses overlaid with increasing levels of abstraction. I drew the diagram at the bottom of this slide that represents my perception of that definition. All of our experiences from multiple sensory inputs are piled somewhere in our gray matter. Whenever confronted with a situation, we access that massed pile of bits of information and create a meaning. This is a unique creative process for each individual, resulting in a unique meaning for each individual. The main point is that meaning that impacts respondent behaviors occurs in the respondent. Often in health messaging, we craft elaborate, well-thought-out messages that represent our meanings, yet often become frustrated when the meanings in the heads of our respondents are obviously different than ours and ultimately result in temporary or no change of behaviors. Health professionals need to be more respondent-oriented, concerned with meaning, not just word or message transfers in health communications. 
This diagram is adapted from Dr. Peter Sandman's book, Responding to Community Outrage. I would highly recommend this book for anyone in public health leadership. There are two scales, including level of hazard or real public risk that ranges from low to high and amount of concern that ranges from none to outrage. The blue oval represents a situation of low concern and hazard, the area of no concern or problems. We would all like to live in that oval as a public health professional, but that's not reality. The red oval is an area of high concern to the point of outrage, but low real public health risk or hazard. An example of an outrage situation would include SARS. SARS is an acronym that stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. This infection caused an epidemic from November 2002 to July of 2003. SARS was caused by a coronavirus and caused 8,098 symptomatic infections and resulted in 774 deaths worldwide in 37 countries, with a majority of cases in China. The case fatality rate was 9.6%. No cases have been reported worldwide since 2004. The primary route of transmission was by contact with mucous membranes or via respiratory droplets. There were no effective antivirals, therefore leaving the only treatment as supportive care. SARS caused a lot of public concern to the point of outrage, yet the actual risk to the general public was quite low. There is a strong element of irrationality and emotion in outrage. According to Dr. Sandman, special skills in outrage management are required to handle situations like this. Statistics are generally not the answer in these irrational emotional situations. Outrage requires a different approach, a more human, feeling, understanding approach to the public, saying things like, I understand your concern, and we will get through this situation together. I'm with you. That's often difficult for public health scientists who are primarily people of statistics and data. The maroon oval represents a true crisis associated with high outrage or concern and high public health risk or hazard. This is a true crisis. Influenza pandemics would be a true crisis for the general public. In those situations, a public health leader needs to utilize classic crisis management skills. I would refer you to a summary article and references in Wikipedia for further crisis communications information. The green oval is the area of public apathy where the public hazard is high, but there's relatively low public concern. Chronic diseases and injury prevention finds itself generally in this area of public apathy with minimal concern, though the hazard is medium to high. In this situation, strategies are needed to move the concern factor to the sweet spot, where people are concerned but not irrational, stimulated to change high-risk behaviors associated with chronic diseases and injury. Dealing with public apathy is a challenge. This slide is not comprehensive, but lists some general strategies to increase public awareness and concern, including portray role models the public will identify with, use multiple modes or venues of communication to saturate the community with consistent messages like television, radio, public service announcements, billboards, social media feeds, etc. Reinforce mass media campaigns with interpersonal communications using town meetings or community discussion formats. Utilize education through entertainment venues when appropriate using drama, music, poetry, etc. Sustain awareness efforts over a long period with regular communications and events. Engage other community change agent organizations including schools, workplaces, faith-based organizations, etc. All communities have structures and organizations. Community structures exist to resist change. 
Organizations, by definition, are community change agents. The title of the community group is not always helpful in determining whether they function as a structure or organization. It often takes some community research to determine their role and attitude. Work with organizations when encouraging community change. The last suggestion is to contextualize messages. The definition of contextualization is making concepts or ideals relevant in a given situation. When the level of public concern is elevated appropriately is a key time to present a message. For example, let's consider West Nile virus in North Dakota during my tenure as state health officer. We knew West Nile virus would likely impact North Dakota in the summer of 2003 following the amplification phase of the virus in birds. We tried to message the importance of mosquito bite precautions in the early spring, but there was no interest with the press or public. In August, there were a number of West Nile cases reported, including deaths. The concern for West Nile virus elevated into the sweet spot, a prime time for West Nile preventive messages. The main point is that public health needs to be more opportunistic with messaging. Choosing timely messages to capitalize on the time when the public is in the sweet spot. As scientists, we often carefully plan our messages, fitting a designated timeline that may not match the public's interests. Carefully planned messaging is important, but we must also be flexible enough, more opportunistic to message on issues that align with the public's current interests. These interests often reflect issues of current interest to the media. A message at other times may not be as effective or the best use of limited resources. This slide provides good strategic guidance to changing risky behaviors. Even though this relates to changing high-risk HIV behaviors in Africa, the concepts have much broader applications. This is from an MMWR editorial from June 2001. CDC identified four attributes of programs for changing high-risk HIV behaviors, including high-level leadership support, formal leadership endorsement at the local, district, state, or national level, have a good plan using best or promising practices. Just implementing a practice is not enough. Best or at least promising practices are key. Having said that, understand that all best practices have not been identified. There's always room to experiment with new ideas and applications, promising practices to continue to expand the list of best practices. Also, the best practices that relate to some areas like urban areas may not work in rural or tribal areas. In these situations, there is need for further research to identify best practices for those special and often underserved populations. The third attribute is committing adequate resources, adequate quantities of personnel and materials over an adequate period of time to accomplish goals. Last but not least is community involvement or true community engagement that fosters local ownership of problems and their solutions. Much of what we do in the name of community engagement here in the United States and around the world is community coercion, where experts external to a community identify problems, develop solutions for those problems, apply for and receive grants, and then approach and attempt to sell this plan to the community. This is coercion, not engagement, and seldom, if ever, results in true community ownership of problems and solutions. For true community engagement, the community must be involved, control and own the process from the very beginning. The community will determine even if there will be a process or program. This is true community engagement. True community engagement requires a special set of competencies and skills to facilitate communities to own and address their problems. Communities provide powerful venues to improve the health and well-being of the group 
in primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Basic community engagement concepts must be understood and applied to effectively facilitate communities to own their problems and solutions. This slide lists 20 topics used to train public health practitioners in community engagement. A few comments about communities. A community in community engagement doesn't always fit the geopolitical definition used commonly in public health. A community engagement expert would likely define a community using two major criteria. First, knowing each other by first name. This usually means that a community is limited to 1,000 to 1,500 people, which is approximately the maximum number of people a person can know by first name. The second criteria for community engagement is that a group must demonstrate a sense of shared responsibility for each other. People may know each other by first name, but have no concern for each other's welfare. An example of this could be individuals living in an apartment complex, knowing each other by name, but having no other connection or commitment. Communities can be divided into five major groups, including rural towns that meet the community definition and are generally 1,000 to 1,500 individuals in size, faith-based groups, workplaces, schools, Schools are complex, composed of several sub-communities based on staff, students further stratified by homeroom, class, school organizations, etc. The last group of communities is other organizations that meet the community definition, including ethnic groups, street children, prostitutes, Knights of Columbus, Rotary, Optimists, sororities, fraternities, social media groups, etc. Many basic competencies apply to community engagement across these five groups of communities, yet there are several unique competencies for several of these groups like schools, faith-based, and workplaces. This is a common communication model. As mentioned before, the main objective of communications is to transfer accurate meanings from a source to a respondent. The source must choose an appropriate medium, for example, a public service announcement, lecture, newspaper ad, radio or television spot, billboard, social media post, etc. to deliver a message. The message is then encoded and delivered by the source. The respondent decodes the message and creates a unique meaning as previously discussed. There are seven major dimensions that define cultural distance. The distance between source and respondent or receiver of a message, including worldview, ways of believing or deep beliefs, cognition, ways of thinking, linguistic forms, the ways of expressing ideas, behavioral patterns, ways of acting, social interactions or ways of interacting, media influences, the ways of channeling messages and Motivational resources are the ways of deciding. The more one culture, the message source, differs from another culture, the respondent or receiver of a message, in these seven dimensions, the greater the cultural distance and resultant difficulty in communicating effective messages and meaning between those cultures. Understanding these dimensions is essential for effective public health communications and also effective community engagement. This slide lists two general strategies to decrease the cultural distance between message sources and respondents to be more effective in the transfer of effective messages and meaning that impact risky behaviors. Cultural immersion of the message source in the respondent culture is possible, but generally takes time months to years, if ever, to accomplish. This obviously doesn't fit well into most grant or program schedules. A more efficient route is to use message sources or individuals from the target culture. These folks are already enculturated since they live in that culture. Every community has respected individuals, generally informal leaders or horizontal communicators. These are the go-to people of the community 
who have exceptional skills to influence community members. These individuals are called by a variety of names in the literature, including horizontal communicators, influential individuals in class, opinion leaders, peer communicators, and champions. A major strategy of community engagement is to identify and adequately engage the horizontal communication system of a target community. A horizontal communicator may be recognized as the go-to person in one area of interest, like health, yet may not be recognized as an authority in other areas like faith-based, economic, political areas, etc. The horizontal communicator for health issues may be a health professional like a nurse, physician, nurse practitioner, chiropractor, etc. For spiritual issues, it may be a tribal medicine man or woman or elder in a church. For political issues, it may be a community activist. It is important to identify the appropriate horizontal communicators for specific areas of messaging in community engagement. All societies have elements of class and status. Class is defined as a continuum between open and closed. Open societies allow relative ease of communicating and moving between classes versus closed societies. The United States and England would be considered open societies where India and Spain are more closed. Generally, there are three social classes in each community, upper, middle, and lower. Class is associated with certain behavioral expectations and is fairly well defined. For example, a person living in a certain part of town may be associated with a certain social class. Certain jobs may be associated with class. For example, a physician or lawyer may be considered upper class in some communities where other jobs may be associated with the middle or lower social classes. Superimposed on the class system is a status system and roles. Status is the social position assigned or achieved by an individual. Role is the acting out of one's status. Every member of a society or community has his or her statuses and roles. A man may have the status of son to his mother, physician to his patients, and elder in the church. In each of these statuses, a person is expected to fulfill certain roles or behaviors. Generally, People want to interact with people of equal or higher status and seek to move up in status with every opportunity. With that last statement in mind, a person can generally only significantly impact those of equal or lower status. Influential individuals are located at the upper end of each class in a community these individuals are those informal leaders, the horizontal communicators, peer communicators, opinion leaders, influential individuals in class and champions. These individuals have exceptional ability to change the beliefs, values, and resultant behaviors of those in their class but equal to or below them in status. These last few slides point out a complexity of community engagement appropriately engaging horizontal communicators in each class and who are identified as community opinion leaders in specific areas like politics, health issues, spiritual matters, etc. that were previously discussed. Failure to appropriately engage the right messengers may result in program failure. This is an important slide demonstrating horizontal and vertical communication between classes. Both horizontal and vertical communication is important for successful community engagement and changing risky behaviors. Communication from a higher class to lower class vertical communication generally results in high prestige, medium message volume or capacity, and low to medium persuasion potential. This would be like utilizing a movie or music celebrity or a professional athlete as a messenger. Public information officers often seek out these types of individuals since they have broad name recognition. Yet realize that these celebrities will only have marginal persuasion potential. 
They often suffer from silver spoon syndrome. Comments often heard include, they don't understand the reality of life in my situation. It's nice that they care and I respect them for that, but they don't totally identify with my needs. Low to higher class communication, we'll call reverse vertical communication, is generally poor, associated with low prestige, message volume, and persuasion. Horizontal communication is generally associated with moderate prestige, but high message volume and persuasion. The utilization of horizontal communicators is a major tenet of true community engagement. Finding well-respected individuals of high status within their class who can effectively communicate horizontally within their class. Horizontal communicators are often informal, not formal leaders, and therefore often not effectively engaged and used in community engagement programs. These horizontal communicators have incredible potential to influence community and individual behaviors, and if not appropriately engaged, can undermine community engagement in a target area. Having said that, prestige support, formal leadership support, higher class to lower class communication, vertical communication, is important for successful engagement. An essential first step in community engagement is to obtain formal leadership support for the program or message. Their support will lend authority, respect, and prestige, though that support may not have great impact on message volume and dissemination or persuasion to lower classes in the community. Their non-support could be devastating, as you might imagine. A main point is that horizontal communicator messages within each class of a target community is generally the most effective communication method to change behaviors. It's not only important to identify and engage horizontal communicators, those of high status in each class of a target community who are recognized as leaders in specific areas, but those horizontal communicators must also identify with the message to be effective. NIDA identified four levels of identification with the message, including first, no interest in a personal change of behavior or becoming a messenger to others. Second, interest in a temporary personal change of behavior, but no interest in becoming a messenger to others. Third, interest in a permanent change of personal behavior, but no interest in becoming a messenger to others. Fourth, interest in a permanent change of personal behavior and interest in becoming a messenger to others. Many public health professionals feel that current programs generally engage people in communities at levels one and two and rarely at levels three and four. Horizontal communicators must identify with a message at the fourth level or nothing will happen. They won't be messengers in their community. So how do we move horizontal communicators to the fourth level of message identification? Communities and individuals, including horizontal communicators, will engage in programs and projects they perceive as important. These perceived needs may or may not reflect the real needs as perceived by the community engagement facilitator or other external experts. Yet these are the issues the community will own and address. Community engagement is facilitating a process of problem solving not a project. It is facilitating a community to own their problems and solutions, not an external perception of their problems. From my experience, engaged communities will eventually address the needs perceived by external experts, but within their priority and time frame, not necessarily mine. This approach will often challenge a community engagement facilitator who would prioritize needs differently. Patience, to move at the pace of the community is essential for true community engagement. Community engagement facilitators help communities identify 
and prioritize their perceived needs by utilizing a variety of nominal group processes and techniques like snow cards, roads to health, etc. This is the cultural egg, also known as G. Linwood Barney's layers of culture. The main point is that our behaviors are the result of deeper influences in each of our lives. It all starts in the center with worldview. Worldview comes from the deepest layer of culture and represents our deep beliefs in four major categories, beliefs of self as human beings, nature, the supernatural, and time, past, present, and future. From these deep beliefs, people aggregate those beliefs into things like ideology or philosophy of life and cosmology, where everything came from, etc. This slide lists some definitions of worldview from cross-cultural literature, including the way people see or perceive the world or the way they know it to be. This reflects the deep belief that this is the way the world truly is. The colored glasses through which people see themselves and the universe around them. We all see the world through colored glasses, meaning that no one actually sees the world as it totally truly is. The way people characteristically look outward upon the universe, or especially to the way a person in a particular society sees himself or herself in relationship to all else. The way people look at reality. Worldview, those deep beliefs, are the center of the cultural egg. What's the difference between culture and worldview? Culture is the way people look to the anthropologist. Anthropologists study people, and from that study develop a description of that people group, essentially looking from the outside of the cultural egg inward. Worldview is how the world appears to a people group, looking from the inside of the cultural egg outward, or how they see the world around them. Studying a culture is easier than trying to put yourself in someone else's position and trying to see things as they see them. Studying a culture often is associated with judgment, since we automatically compare our cultural attributes to the studied culture and commonly judge them. All cultures believe that their culture, including their beliefs and the way they think, feel, and believe is the way to think, feel, and believe. So in cross-cultural situations, all cultures tend to automatically judge the other culture through their own culture's worldview or deep beliefs and values. If the other culture's beliefs and values are different, they're obviously judged as wrong. To be more effective in health communications, public health professionals must try to see the world as the other culture sees it. Just studying a culture from the outside is not enough. As mentioned, all worldviews are likely comprised of four categories of beliefs, including beliefs regarding human beings, beliefs of nature, beliefs of the supernatural, and beliefs of time, past, present, future. These four belief categories encompass groups of beliefs associated with cultural ideology or philosophy of life and cosmology, how the universe was formed, etc. These deep worldview beliefs are deeply ingrained in every culture in the world. Every culture and subculture, including the public health culture, believes that the way they think, feel, and believe is the way to think, feel, and believe. This can, if not understood and appropriately addressed, lead to intolerance of others and can drive a wedge between public health professionals and those we are trying to reach. Back to the cultural egg. These core beliefs, the egg yolk of the cultural egg or worldview, inform the values layer, the things deemed important by a culture. These values impact institutions, the way things are done, like marriage, education, law, governance, etc. 
All of these deeper layers then result in manifest behaviors. It also impacts artifacts, the things cultures make and use, like jewelry, pottery, designs, music, poetry, other art forms, written documents, inscriptions, etc. Archaeologists glean great cultural insights, including the deep beliefs or worldview of cultures from the things made and used by the culture. The main point is that lasting changes in behavior relate to deeper changes in values and worldview. These deep changes are the target of community engagement. It takes special skills and competencies to facilitate communities to consider changing their values and worldview or beliefs associated with risky behaviors. It's important to understand the layers of culture represented by the cultural egg to better understand the difference between social marketing and community engagement, two major tool sets used by public health. Social marketing is a major tool set of public health to impact risky behaviors. Though the ultimate goal of changing behaviors is the same for social marketing and community engagement, social marketing and community engagement target different layers of the cultural egg. The goal of social marketing is to obtain quick changes in behavior, therefore focusing on the outer cultural layer as indicated by the red arrow in the diagram. Social marketing works. When well-crafted, convincing messages are delivered to a target population. The problem is permanency of change. If the deep beliefs and values that drive risky behaviors are not altered, indicated by the white arrow. A social marketing expert at a national immunization conference in 2004 stated the social marketing strategy well. We don't care what a person believes as long as they change their risky behavior. Community engagement focuses on the deep layers of the cultural egg. The deep beliefs or worldview and values that drive risky behaviors. Changes in worldview and their resultant values result in more permanent changes in risky behaviors. A community engagement expert would say changes in beliefs are essential for permanent changes of risky behavior. Social marketing is particularly useful in certain one-time events like immunizations or cancer screening examinations. People don't need to believe as deeply in immunizations and cancer screenings as health professionals as long as they get them. Social marketing can then move on to focus on moving them to the next immunization or cancer screening. Social marketing may not work as well in long-term consistent behavioral changes if not supported by deeper beliefs and values for issues like consistent healthy diets or regular exercise to control obesity, etc. Community engagement requires patience and different techniques to effectively facilitate individuals and communities to consider changing their deep beliefs and values that support more permanent, consistent, healthy behaviors. Another difference between social marketing and community engagement relates to the messenger. Social marketing utilizes highly trained external communication specialists to design and implement social marketing programs. Community engagement uses respected influential individuals, also known as horizontal communicators, opinion leaders, influential individuals in class, peer communicators, etc., to message to their own community. Both social marketing and community engagement tool sets are necessary for public health, yet public health leaders must understand the unique uses of each. I would like to illustrate how different cultural beliefs can impact public health strategies and will use worldviews of time as they relate to communication approaches. This diagram is an oversimplification and obviously doesn't apply to all Western monotheistic adult cultures. 
Yet many of these cultures can be diagrammed as represented on this slide. The size of each circle represents the importance of each aspect of time, the past, the present, and the future. To many Western monotheistic adult cultures, the past or history is somewhat important, informing and providing information to improve how things are done in the present. The future is very important, and to monotheists like Christian, Muslim, or Jewish cultures is even endless or eternal. The present circle is also relatively large since decisions made in the present impact the future. In this worldview, with a large future circle, primary prevention, a major mission of public health makes sense. Doing something in the present to impact the future. For example, exercise and an adequate diet in the present can impact a better cardiovascular system and lead to a longer active life in the future. Other worldviews perceive time differently. Many tribal cultures would draw their time circles as shown here. Once again, this is an oversimplification and doesn't represent all tribal cultures. The past and present circles are larger and more important than the future. Many tribal cultures emphasize the importance of ancestors. The concept of eternity may often be described as how well one is remembered by those that follow. Messages about actions and behaviors that will enhance legacy with family members and the tribal community may resonate more than an emphasis on personal future benefits that may have more impact on Western adult monotheistic cultures as previously described. The current youth culture in the United States would draw the present circle large with small past and future circles, focusing almost exclusively on the present. Youth are not just young adults. They have a different worldview of time as well as other deep beliefs. Youth are concerned about relationships, being together, events, enjoying the present. Messages that focus on present benefits will likely be more effective in emphasizing the future. These last few slides emphasize the importance of understanding a culture's worldview of time, human beings, nature, and the supernatural to develop effective communication strategies to impact risky behaviors and is also important information for community engagement experts in facilitating community engagement processes. Essentially, there are three approaches to communicating across different worldviews. First, invite the respondent to lay aside his or her own worldview and at least temporarily adopt the worldview of the message source. Few individuals are willing to do this. They already feel, as all cultures do, that the way they think, feel, and believe is the way to think, feel, and believe. Why would they want to change or even consider changing? This is a common approach public health scientists utilize in health messaging. They know objective truth from their scientific data and feel the public should just accept their public health worldview. That almost never happens, especially when the deep beliefs and values of the two interacting cultures differ. Second, invite respondents to meet the source halfway. Now, this seems sensible, but practically doesn't work in real life situations since it results in worldview distortions for both the source and respondent. The third option is the most reasonable and has been shown to work in cross-cultural communications. The source tries to understand the worldview of the respondent and then contextualize the message by encoding it in such a way that it will become meaningful to the respondent. This is not easy but is possible and practical. How is worldview information gathered? Background research on cultural history is helpful, including things we previously discussed, things made and used, artifacts like jewelry, pottery designs, music, poetry, stories, myths, written documents or inscriptions, art, etc. Yet the most valuable information comes from spending time working or living in that culture, a technique that's known as enculturation. 
Unfortunately, public health professionals don't have the time or resources to spend months or even years in culturating. This brings us back to the importance of utilizing the tool of community engagement and horizontal communicators in communicating. Going back to the slide on decreasing cultural distance, cultural immersion or enculturation of the message source in the respondent culture is possible, but generally takes time, months to years, if ever, to accomplish. This obviously, as previously mentioned, doesn't fit well into most grant or program schedules. A more efficient route is to use message sources or individuals from the target culture called horizontal communicators through the process of true community engagement. These folks are already enculturated since they live in that culture. All cultures need to change something for their survival and health. Cultures are living entities and therefore are perpetually flexing and adapting to their environment. There are no perfect cultures in the world. Messages to change culture, particularly at the level of deep beliefs and values, whether internal via horizontal communicators in a community engagement program or external via social marketing will create conflict. That conflict will be greater for external versus internal message sources, as you might expect. A major point is that change agents must expect and be willing to endure conflict. That's not a great comfort since almost all people like harmony, not conflict. So how do cultures change? Charles Kraft identified five points. All five of these points are key to true community engagement. First, understand the community's perspective or perceived need to change their culture. This is also identified as the ethnographic approach, which is also the community engagement approach. Communities and people will only invest their resources, including their time in things they think are important. The community or culture is the only entity that has the right and ability to change their culture. The community is in control in community engagement. Community engagement is facilitating a community in a process of problem solving, not a project, which means encouraging a community to address their perceived needs, not necessarily the perceived needs of external public health personnel. Generally, an engaged community will eventually address external perceived needs but in their own time and priority. This approach of facilitating a process of problem solving versus a project doesn't fit well with most public health grant programs, their rigid guidance and timelines. Second, encourage essential worldview, deep beliefs and values level changes of the cultural egg versus more peripheral behavioral changes resulting in a more permanent versus temporary change of behavior. This again emphasizes the difference between the cultural targets of social marketing and community engagement we previously discussed. Third, work with community leaders and the community. The endorsement of community leaders, vertical communicators, is important along with engaging horizontal communicators to influence changes in the cultures or communities, deep beliefs and values associated with risky behaviors. Fourth, recognize the importance of community organizations to affect change. Community structures resist change. Community organizations are community and cultural change agents. Fifth, cultural change requires patience to move at the pace of the community a problem in our grant-driven world, not allowing time for communities to truly engage, to be facilitated in a process of problem solving, to own their problems and solutions. There are three general ways or levels to communicate messages in humans. These levels are part of the human primary message system. The first level is the formal level. 
This is essentially trial and error. Unfortunately, having to use the trial and error process is often dangerous. In health messaging, we try to avoid this way of learning. For example, a person may learn by personal trial and error that smoking actually causes cancer after smoking for 20 years. That message was delivered too late to prevent disease. Second is the technical level. This is essentially a lecture format where a teacher presents information and tries to convince or persuade students to accept and believe the information delivered. This is one of the most common communication tools of traditional public health. Third is the informal level. This utilizes the innate desire of people to imitate role models. These role models may range from peer groups, television, movie stars, parents, community leaders, etc. These role models would include the horizontal communicators, the individuals at the upper status position of their culture or community class. Experts contend that a great part of culture, including values and worldview, are communicated at the informal level versus the formal trial and error or technical teacher levels. For example, children learn early basic language skills via imitation of parents, family, and community members as they speak. This took place outside of awareness in the subconscious. Later, language learning was reinforced and refined by the technical level via teachers. Edward Hall's most important counsel is that if we want to introduce changes particularly in basic beliefs or behavioral patterns of a culture, we must introduce or at least mightily reinforce at the informal out of awareness level. If this is true, much traditional public health communications to change high risk behaviors may not be focused at the most appropriate level, the informal communications level. The informal level of communications is targeted by community engagement programs through the personal actions and behaviors of horizontal communicators. Community engagement also uses horizontal communicators at the technical informal teaching level. Once again, the technical level of teaching is more effective when reinforcing what is being learned at the informal imitation level. Sequencing is important. Informal level, followed by the technical level of learning, seems most effective. As mentioned, much cultural behavioral learning and change occurs at the informal level and is reinforced at the technical level. An important point is that the technical teaching level can either support or react to informal imitation learning. How effective is teaching the technical level of learning healthy behaviors when in conflict with behaviors being regularly imitated in formal level by respected individuals in a person's life? Not great, though it may have some effect. The technical level is much more effective if supporting versus reacting to things learned at the informal level. This is an example of the importance of informal imitation level learning, demonstrating the family influence on tobacco use reported in the MMWR in 2001. In that study, 34.5% of high school students and 15.1% of middle school students used tobacco, yet 70% of middle school and 57% of high school students who currently smoked lived in a home where someone smoked cigarettes. Smoking of students was markedly higher in families that smoked. Peer pressure wouldn't likely explain this. Transfer of messages and meaning, whether good or bad, is more effective in many instances through the family and relates to the informal imitation level of learning. This is a summary slide of basic concepts for changing risky behaviors and includes be more respondent oriented, 
try to vision through the worldview lens of the target culture. This respondent orientation will inform messages and strategies to change risky behaviors. Be more opportunistic or flexible in health messaging, adapting to appropriate contexts and times. Community engagement is an essential public health tool for changing risky behaviors. True community engagement relinquishes control and ownership of programs to the community. Incorporate horizontal communication strategies to change risky behaviors. Realize the importance of informal messaging in changing behaviors. Traditional teaching is most effective if reinforcing informal messaging. Utilize all behavior change tools available, policy, clinical, and social marketing and community engagement. Use social marketing for short-term behavioral changes and in support of long-term changes. Use community engagement skills to change values and worldview that drive risky behaviors.